I'll pass over to you, Catherine. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, so, as uh, Gemma said, my name is Catherine Causley. I'm the Climate Change Officer at uh, East Seven District Council. Now, um, climate change is, we declared a climate emergency in 2019, um, along with Seven County Council and about 300 other uh, local parish, town and um, uh, unitary authorities. Getting to net zero is going to be an absolutely massive task. The scale of radical transformational change that is needed is uh, the sort of thing that keeps me up at night. However, we have the commitment um, of our uh, councillors and the support of all the departments that I work with. I don't do this on my own, it's a big job. I'm part of a team and I work with and through all the departments we work with. So, I work with people like the Thelma Hubbard Gallery, um, and also I work with all sorts of um, uh, of our other teams, such as our street scene team, um, countryside team, and, and all the others. We are doing a lot. It's very hard, as you can imagine, to affect the sort of change that's required. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of everything we've done, but one of the things that we have done is, and we've measured our carbon footprint. We have seen a reduction, but our carbon footprint is about 22,000 tonnes um, of carbon a year. We need to reduce that, ideally in half by 2030. Now, the first half will be the easy half, and the second half is going to be the hard half. Now, just to do our housing stock alone, we're the landlords to 4,300 tenanted properties, so that's without our commercial buildings, we're looking at an investment of somewhere in the region of £169 million. So as you can see, this is not easy, quick, um, or something we can do overnight, sadly. However, we have the commitment, we have the people behind us, and um, we have uh, the residents of Devon who want us to act, and uh, we're going to do our absolute best for you. However, uh, I will be here for answers, at the, uh, for questions and answers at the end, and I will hang around for a bit afterwards. So if you've got any specific points you'd like to discuss with me, I'm always happy to talk about climate change. But first of all, let's get on to Mikhail, and uh, let's get on to the amazing work that you've been doing. Um, I think perhaps we have a conversation, and perhaps um, you could start by explaining when the, the overall larger project started and what the inspiration was for that. Sure. Um, so Acoustics of Resistance, um, the ideas started um, coming together um, sometime at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, not... Um, out of the blue, because a lot of the work, um, I've been an artist, I've been working professionally as an artist for about 20 years. And a lot of my earlier work is about, the, um, explores the relationship between different communities and the environment. So I worked with, you know, as you know, with coal miners, with pearl divers, um, with uh, people who, are, who live and work um, in, um, uh, geothermal power plants. So that has always been a concern of mine, but something um, called COVID and uh, lockdowns and, and um, standstills um, really um, alarmed me and made me think that um, if, there is only, if there is one subject that I should be focusing on as an artist and be contributing and talking about and doing community work on, what would that be? And I thought it needs to be climate change. So it was for me it was a kind of almost a kind of moral um, uh, reorientation to and, a big and extent. And also, you've been an activist as well. So. Also, have been an activist um, for since my student years. Um, and yeah, so what does that mean? Also for someone, if you think about, and I reflect a lot on what enabled my career to be the way it is, is cheap travel, international travel. Um, if you see, um, if you were to see my CV or when I look at it, it's, it's almost shameful, but it's also uh, a source of pride. Yeah. Um, when you see you know how many different countries the work was produced in and traveled to um, this comes with a very heavy 
carbon footprint. Yeah. So and this is actually something that the cultural uh, sector, you know, pop music, um, theatre, uh, pop music is like is a very big contributor, but also contemporary art is very is. It's, there is a, it's a blind spot. So just to give you an idea, in 2019, I made um, 70 flights for my work, which is about two, two a week. Um, and uh, my life, I was miserable because it's not good for your health. <laughs> it, might be, it might be good for your, for your career, but it's not good for your body, for your relationship, for your friendships for your um, diet, it's just really, really not good for you. And it's definitely not good for the environment. Um, so, you know, if there was a radical, there has been a radical change. I'm not saying I don't travel, but, you know, I'm a lot more conscious and it's been, re I've reduced it to more than half. Um, and at that point you were living in London? And that, at that point I was living in London. Yeah. At that point, I was living in London. Yes. And so, did some of this change come about because of your move to Lisbon, or is this all kind of running in parallel? The, uh, running in parallel, yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, moving to Lisbon was, um, I mean, very early on in the pandemic, um, I lost a friend in the third week of lockdown to COVID. And, and then a lot of other friends, were, because London was crazy at that point, it just became very apocalyptic. The feeling became very dark and apocalyptic. And um, throughout my my career uh, and in my personal life, I, I feel that I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to also I want to be a source of hope and a source of a kind of uh, someone that inspires others and as well as myself, of course. But you know, people around me to change things for the better and to imagine hopeful futures. Um, London was not, it was not that place at that moment. Uh, also, we had just um, exited, or we were exiting, actually, we had not ex exited Europe, but the referendum had been voted on, and that had a, was having a serious implication on my, on my work. Um, so yeah, this is when the decision came to move, and also, you know, reduce. Um, and this partic particular project, you were saying that you didn't actually have funding at the beginning? I had no funding to make this project at the beginning and it started with um, a lecture performance that I did on Zoom at that point uh, that included um, recordings that I had made of protests, of climate protests that I had uh, uh, gone to uh, with, you know, uh, Friday for Futures with young people. Um, and it was my reflections on what I'm handing to the next generation. Um, so this project um, comes out of um, that. It comes out of my frustration with um, climate-oriented um, or themed art that very often it simply translates or transposes climate data or scientific data to visual or audiovisual uh, data and very often I felt confused by it. Um, so I thought, what and, do and I do? And not just you. I, I, I think... Um, <laughs> Well, audiences too and visitors can see quite remote and kind of cold and yeah, I think what you're bringing is a, a warmth and a care. But anyway, I'm interrupt. Well, no, you're not interrupting. You're kind of egging me on. So I, I decided to uh, approach the theme through uh, three angles. Um, one is informed by science and uh, climate modeling data. Um, we don't see the, the entire project here, uh, but what we see in the room in the upper in this the gallery on this floor is um, a thermal image or map of of what Europe looked like um, in the um, the begin at the beginning of last summer during the very first and very strange heat wave we had in um, in June last June. Um, I'm also working with um, um, flood maps of the future and images that show us science scientific images that um, attempt to show us what how our coastal especially our coastal geographies will transform in the next 
well, they're transforming, but how that transformation will be more permanent uh, from 2050 onwards. Um, so this climate data uh, or climate modeling data, then I use in workshops that I um, devise and work with uh, predominantly young people, but also with, I mean, with any age group. In this particular case, for, for this exhibition, uh, I worked with 12-year-old children in a, in, a prime, in a high school. Honiton Community College. Community College. Um, to produce the, the, um, one of the spaces downstairs with the flags. So just to, and that, that room is just, is, it gives us glimpses uh, or traces of what actually happened over the three days or more, four, three, four days that I was there. Um, so the, the process starts with a conversation around the environment um, um, and the elements. So with 12 year olds, you know, you talk about the elements, what do they look like? How do you sense them? Where do you feel them? Um, then I presented to them at some point um, maps of um, 2050 that we have, we all have access to. All of this information is online. I would, uh, for, for example, I would recommend a website called uh, climatecentral.org and there, there, there are different parameters that you can put in, but basically you, you can see if the place where you live or your nearby uh, town or city or uh, you, where your relatives are, how that will be um, impacted upon by flooding. Um, so we were looking at uh, these maps and indeed, um, I mean, a lot of Britain will experience by 2050 radical transformations and I was just having these conversations with them. Um, and were they surprised by this or um, have, have they been taught this already? No, they have not been given those details. Right. No. Because um, it, it does strike me that um, obviously we've had a lot of this information for 30, 30 years or more and, the, and actually climate scientists have ring, been ringing the alarm bells for really quite a long time. Um, but somehow they haven't been able to communicate or cut through. The magnitude of it. I mean, they were yeah. talking to me about recent flooding in uh, villages uh, nearby. But for example, I showed them um, uh, London in 2050 and you know, uh, North Kent, uh, Essex, and a lot of central London basically is underwater. And I was trying to, um, to get them to think of the, the scale, of, you know, what is the scale of this? So I asked them, how many people live in London? Actually, I was surprised by that <laughs> because they said, um, 5,000? No, a little bit more than that. You know, this is 12 year olds. Don't they know the population of the capital of the country? Anyway, they didn't, they didn't know. So I told yeah. them it's around you know, 10 to 14 million, depending on yeah. um, uh, if you consider also the uh, greater London area. And then when we looked at, so when I gave them that figure of 14 million people and I showed them the map, then they thought, oh my God, you know, millions of people will have to be relocated. Yeah. And I told them, what does that mean? They said, well, we have to build schools, we have to build hospitals, we have to build new homes somewhere else. These people, I told them, where are they going to go? They said, maybe they're going to come here. <laughs> so just to, and, I, and this is the process, which is around, you know, my idea of the universe of solutions. And, and what I do um, is a way of I think culture has the ability and art, if you think that art is really the domain that nourishes and works with the imagination, it brings things into being that have not been there before. It's very generative. Um, even, you know, a child makes a drawing or comes up with a sentence that has not, or even what children do at school, they, they make up songs and games. They come up with things that have not existed before. And this is the incredible thing about, you know, art as a human kind of invention, um, that it, we can also come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So, And had, had you worked with children about this age on this project before? So did no, you? no, older, older yeah. Uh, students, yeah, 90, right. 18, 19 year olds, yeah. Right. So did you, was it noticeably different for you, the, the, the kind of responses and work that was 
possible no, it's to generate. seemed more free in right. some ways. You know, um, some of them are very pragmatic. So I would yeah. show them the maps and then I told them, OK, now we've talked about problems. I'd like you to think about solu possible solutions and let's all start the sentence we could and then finish it in whatever way we imagine and write this down. So you see some glimpses of that downstairs on the wall in their handwriting with their own sketches. And you're invited also if you want to write your own you know, practical or imaginary solutions, you're very welcome to put it on the post-it notes. Um, so some of the children would be very pragmatic and say, OK, let's, we need to elevate our home. Homes, or we need to build walls. Others would say we can invent a serum that turns us into mermaid mutants, um, which I think, you know, it's actually, it's a very valid response. Maybe there is a way of you know, transforming. There are different ways of uh, thinking about the problem. But the idea of what I do is that um, um, through the work, preparing, I feel, or I want, the next generation, both emotionally as well as um, um, logic, not logically, was emotionally and what is the cerebral, not cerebral, um, mentally, um, psychologically and mentally to be thinking about the changes that we need to make and what solutions we might need to think of. Um, but despite having done what sounds like um, a, a relatively practical solution-based workshop, you're not a policy maker and you're, 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 you're not a scientist and you're not working with an institution to make those changes. So you're coming at it to produce very powerful, rather beautiful, impactful work. So um, I think hopefully you've all had a chance to see the film works and um, and if you haven't experienced Mikhail's work before, um, the combination of image and sound is always really powerful. I mean, the first work I ever saw was Children of the Unquiet at the British Art Show in Leeds um, and that was year, many, many years ago and um, it affected me really quite deeply and I thought it was the outstanding work of that show which is Thank a very you. very big show I have to say <laughs> and then Thank subsequently you. followed Mikhail's work since then and um, it seems to me that um, sound has been very important in your work for a very long time and obviously that particular work has il illustrates that but how um, I think for some people who don't work as artists or in the art world um, to, to jump from those cerebral idea based um, possible solutions to something that is ev evocative and um, um, almost overwhelming but not terrifying um, and encapsulates a number of um, ideas. Um, can you say something about that and then maybe you could say something about the the performances of the yeah, which connects, yeah. it connects us to the yeah. the first work we see yeah. in the bigger uh, gallery yeah. um, well sound or rather sound we perceive through listening um, not only also you know a vibration on the body on the skin but um, I think of listening as um, both as something that um, activates our ability to empathize mm -hmm. if we really deeply listen to something someone we uh, th that that empathy um, evolves de develops grows um, and if we really truly want to respond to what we listen to uh, we need to listen mm -hmm. you know we need to empathize mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, I think of it also as an activist force, because if you think of um, what activists do when they go to protest, they, they, they try to make something that has been um, neglected, overseen, unheard, they try to make it visible and audible. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something about you know, listening there that I connect also with activism and some also it became this to me, this became very apparent to me when I worked with people that are nonverbal and that some of them had severe disabilities and they needed carers of how care, carers, one of the first things they need to do is listen, to listen to what that person wants 
wants to say, but they're not able to because they're nonverbal. How do they communicate? How do they, you know, transmit? And what is it that they transmit? Um, so yeah, listening has this power. Um, but also, there's something about um, the responsibility that I feel that I have to learn the language of the other, whatever that other is. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, in this project, I'm thinking of nature as that that speaks a language that I need to learn. Right. But yeah. we've been doing this, you know, humans have been doing this forever. Um, it's just perhaps modernity, our relation to technology, um, urban environments that uh, somehow desensitize our listening and our, our ability to connect with nature. But um, what the installation comprises of is performers that play they, they play instruments. Some of them are ancient uh, instruments, ceremonial instruments, some of them are more contemporary. But each one has been designed by humans to imitate the sounds of different weather phenomena. So here we are, humans, mm -hmm. speaking in the, or singing in the language of nature. Mm -hmm. um, so what that installation uh, tries to do is create a kind of weather system uh, with, within, the, within, within an interior domestic here, also space, formerly domestic space, a kind of weather system uh, through sound. And then um, on the screen, uh, not on the projections, but on the screen, we see and hear um, four folk singers from different uh, traditions. So there is a Danish singer, um, there is a, a Kurdish Syrian singer who I met in Athens. He's one of the. Uh, he's he's a refugee from uh, Syria, and then someone from Madeira and someone from uh, mainland Portugal, and they're folk singers that sing um, songs that address natural elements directly. So one of them is about the fog. Um, so these are not songs that use um, natural you know, images of nature to represent human emotions. They are songs that directly address, they speak to, they sing to different weather phenomena, the storm, the sea, like the Syrian refugee sings a song which is about the people that lost their, it comes from the idea of the, um, or the sentiment of the refugees that lost their lives at sea, at storm, and he sings to the rain and he sings to the storm. Um, um, the one from Madeira sings to, um, um, the, to the fog and says, please go away so that I can see my way. Because of you, fog, I've almost lost my life. Um, so I see folk songs as a kind of reservoir of human sentiments um, that um, or as a kind of archive of human sentiments that capture this relationship we have with the elements. And what I do in that installation, I bring them together. Did you know that you were going to have folk songs as part of the work when you set, set it out? I mean, we're in a great folk, folk tradition here in Devon, actually. So many people here will know um, of the the folk music and songs um, around here, which they, they'll, they'll be able to recognise that, you know, we, we have wassails and um, we, we, we sing to nature, actually. Um, did, I, I'm very interested in your process because I, I know, because you told me, that you, you didn't have these four folk singers no. all at the same time. You met them over a period of time. Yeah, that's also because I had no funding. Yes. Um, <laughs> and also, yeah, because of that idea of I didn't want to just travel to these places, yeah. you know, fly to some place. Uh, no, I didn't know. And I um, and it would be interesting. I mean, my idea is to continue developing this project because obviously there are folk traditions in different places and there are also instruments or ways in which humans imitate sound phenomena, mm. uh, uh, weather, the sounds of weather phenomena with different objects. So. I, ideally, I would like to develop this project in, you know, different parts and different places where people bring their own cultures. Um, and um, with these particular performers, um, 
did you prompt prompt them to sing a particular song or discuss the project and then they chose the song? Yeah, we would discuss the project and yes. we would do research into um, like archives of folk uh, mm. songs or we would have to speak to some master of folk songs yeah. and things. Yeah. Also, not all of them call them songs, these ones. Some right. of them in Scandinavia, they call them weather calls oh. so it's not a song because the song is it's something Very else so these are supposed to be the scandinavian one is supposed to be sung outdoors in the field um and you just you know you you call the, that one is about it uh, it asks the 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 clouds and rain to leave and invites the sun uh to come to warm up the earth and the seeds to sprout um, so actually there is a word which is very similar to English, uh, ran for rain. So if you listen back to that song, you will recognize she uses that word a lot. So is this the female singer with the plait and the beautiful costume, which is made out of uh, folk um, um, tablecloths, right. you know, embroidered yeah, yeah. tablecloths. Um, and the way you've installed that here is on a single screen facing the, the two channel piece um, with the musicians. Um, was, was that always a plan or um, are you responding to this site? I'm responding to the space yeah. because actually this installation had different um, configuration before. Yeah. Uh, it even had more screens for a bigger space yeah. or even fewer screens but yeah. this is quite specific to here so the idea was to to attend that the visitors come to an immersive concert so we are actually going to a concert on one side we have the instrumentalists yes. uh, that are kind of more suspended because they connect more to the elements uh, that come from the sky or the atmosphere yeah. and then on the other side we have uh, a heavier screen on a on a um, tripod um, with a singer that is more or less at our level eye level mm -hmm. and we are in between them between the human addressing the elements and the and the elements you know the instrumentalists uh, creating the these uh, noises mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to involve the the audience in this sort of triangle. I see, yeah. 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 Um, so the way in which you work with the musicians, um, is that partly improvisatory or um, have you scored that at all? Or it was they... not scored, no, it was improvisatory. Yeah. And um, so we, we, spent, we spent a day and um, some of them would... Um, work on would play on an instrument of course i would explain the idea and what yeah. i wanted um so they would spend some time improvising on an instrument and then sometimes they would play together but then the final composition uh of how all the sounds come together that was in post-production that was you know in my studio yes. um in a way <laughs> In some ways, it's similar to to sculpture. If you think about it, you know, you might go out and look for materials, um, and then bring them to the studio and construct them or composing. Yeah. I work with sound in a similar way. Right. Oh, that's that's fascinating. That's a really um, great analogy. Um, um, has anybody got a burning question at the moment? Yes. Yes. Um, I am very interested in what you were saying about reducing your travelling um, because you said in 2019 you did 70 flights and then and then you reduced it to less than half, so say about 30 or so. And I would say, I mean, during COVID it was obviously we couldn't travel. No. Um, but since September I have had, I have taken maybe about mm, 11 flights or 10 flights. Mm -hmm. Um, do you not think um, that Zoom could reduce that even further? Because I didn't know about Zoom at all until we had the pandemic. And, you know, that's what I'm doing now. Um, and I, I was thinking the possibility of how the hell do you get your art into a different country on Zoom? You can't really. But, um, you know, physically, if it's a physical piece of art, you, you need to put it there. 
um, Mr. Trammell. So I'm just wondering. It's the process, you see. I only. Tr I don't travel for holidays. No. <laughs> I only travel. I only travel when my I feel my presence is essential to do the workshops with the children because. For me, to have that direct connection with the people I work with um, is important. I don't want to delegate that. I mean, I know a lot of artists delegate that, um, but then I can see it in the work. Somehow, the, that kind of emotional engagement. Yeah. That, so I work with children for 35 yeah. years. I, you know, I'm a nursery yes. nurse, so I, I know what you're talking about, but we're also being told that getting to net zero yes. is going to be one hell of a job. And so compromises have to be made yes. in order to achieve that. But I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. Yes. I, I think it's a very interesting point um, yes. around how artworks move, move around and how other people do. So um, um, I work at the museum in Exeter and um, in terms of courier trips, which is where you accompany a work of art when, where it's loaned, and many of our works are loaned all over the world, um, we're now doing vir virtual courier trips, and, and, and so are our colleagues elsewhere. So we had a Matisse in the museum recently in the exhibition Hollow Earth, um, and we deinstalled that last week, and the courier was on a laptop and watched the Matisse um, you know, taken off the wall mm. and packaged and put into the crate. Um, and in the past, that courier would have travelled from Norwich, for example. Mm. Um, but now we're all trying not to do those journeys. Or if a journey needs to be done for an exhibition abroad, then we uh, we agreed that our colleagues at the National Gallery, who've all got also got to work in the exhibition, can you know check out our picture as well. So. Um, uh, yeah, the, the the famous painting, man in a um, red, red suit, which has been at Cambridge and is going to tour then to London, um, has has never been couriered by us physically. We've um, accepted that other people will look look after that. Very rare painting, um, but. It, yeah, we, we, we do have to make so big changes. So changes are being made? Yes, we're getting solar panels put on the roof at the Museum Exeter and also a heat pump um, and all the vehicles that are driven by Exeter City Council employees are all electric. We've got a solar farm and we're committed to net zero by 2030. Um, so, yeah, it's a big ask. ask. No, it's a big ask. I think for, for an organisation to make these fundamental changes yeah. uh, is one thing. I think there's something about the, the whole economics of involved in cultural workers. Because, I mean, I have a, convers a similar conversation, you know, uh, regularly with institutions. Um, and I always say, I don't want to create, I don't want to have like three commissions like three new works every year. I don't want th three new commissions plus all the other shows. I want to be able to make one new project because it takes a, you know, a lot of work, one new project. But the salary, the money that that gives me is not enough for me to live on. So it's, it's, um, I know. Yeah, I know. it's like such a complicated, it's such a complicated question. It's work, it's never finished. It's ongoing. Because yes. More comes into the mix all the time. You never yes. finish. Yeah. 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 I yes, know. but um, you know, reducing, doing things on Zoom. I have, re re to be honest, I've had some really crazy invitations. You know, I had an invitation from Zurich, uh, from the art school in Zurich, to do a talk on on art and sustainability and the talk was supposed to be 20 minutes and they wanted me to fly there <laughs> and I said this is absolutely out of the question <laughs> and they were insisting and I said well I'm not going to do it then I told them I wanted to do it on zoom but the thing is we shouldn't think that digital you know um, that transferring data and watching films online and all of that that this is carbon neutral because this is a very big pollutant as well there are huge spaces throughout the world that have servers that are so hot and they need so much um, 
you know, um, ventilation. I mean, all everything produced. I actually, I was working on a project with young people that were about 20 years old, and we calculated that the data that we produced filming, you know, the we were the thing the project we're filming, because. We, we were all from different countries and we said, okay, let's make a virtual hard drive. To transfer the data was equivalent to driving between Luxembourg, where we were, and um, Andalusia in southern Spain seven times. Right. It's like, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. And of course, so much of the value in your carbon is you are bigger than the sum of your carbon. You know, the, the impact you have on people's imagination, people's thinking, people's engagement is worth every ounce of carbon. So you know, I think that actually, you know, you're right, maybe not to fly for a 20 minute Zoom, what could be a 20 minute Zoom, but you know, there is carbon in everything. <laughs> Sorry, because we are, being, we are being recorded. I think you should. I think that's this mic though. Ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, you do. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, just to say, I don't think you should actually beat yourself up too much about it because the the value of of what you do is so enormous, um, and the world would be a duller place without you and uh, other artists. So. <laughs> well, that's very generous of you. Thank you. Does Does anybody else have a question at the moment? Yes. It's, I hope you just won't be repetitive because you're kind of building on it. I was wondering if you have any advice for artists who may be at the point that you're at earlier in your career who want to engage international audiences or communities and also maybe don't have funding. Like with your experience now and also with the digital experience now, is there any guidance that you would give? Um, I think what was very important to building my career, for building my career, um, is has been um being present in um you know attending openings but you probably have heard this before attending openings supporting colleagues um seeing and tuning into who is doing work that is including curators what curator what museum what institution is doing work that is that you can imagine your work being there in terms of thematically um, and supporting them, making yourself visible to them and developing those networks. I think, you know, that's the case, I think, with most, uh, if not all freelancers, is developing a network and being visible in that network, contributing to that, and, and that usually is returned. I think... Um, digital learning um, has had an impact. Um, I've, I've been involved in education also for a very long time at, univers at university and I was trying to explain the idea of a community and a network uh, to my students and they found it so difficult to understand um, because they would just come to the Zoom, often they wouldn't make the, themselves visible um, they wouldn't even talk and then they would ask me to write um, like at the end of the year they would ask me to write a reference and uh, I was telling them I need to know you I need to be able to recognize you how can I write a reference for you if I don't know if we haven't developed some kind of interpersonal connection um, zoom is a connector but is also a disconnector in that in terms of that interpersonal kind of connection so um, apply 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 I would say to for funding um, connect with uh, practitioners of your uh, that you feel you're like-minded um, but from the whole spectrum of 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 the sector yeah but I guess okay I guess in the context of also taking on board all this question around climate change and the impact of that, it sounds like the answer is just being selective in terms yes. of making sure that it's really going to be worth making the journey. Making. Yes. 
Yeah, or, or choose how you travel or, or, you know, reduce your carbon in the rest of your life. You know, you can give up your car, you can get overland trains, you, yeah. Become vegan. And, and, yeah, or, I, but I, um, I think I'm, I'm interested in getting back to your, your practice as well and maybe thinking about some of the other work that you made before this. So I went to the Whitstable Biennial a few years ago um, I don't know if any of you have been to that festival before, but it's a contemporary art festival in Kent. Tim, have you been? Yeah, yeah. So um, Tim's from Hestercombe, who was, has also shown Mikhail's work. I have shown Mikhail's, and you've talked to him. Children yeah. of Anguirus. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Um, and it was beautifully shown there. As well. And likewise, I came across you in, in uh, the British Art Show. Yeah. So, um, yeah, try and, try and get in uh, big big group shows as well. <laughs> and so that particular work that you made, because I always think of your work, as you're talk talking about needing to be with people, and I would say that is very specific to your practice, your um, relationship building, your act of care, the, the listening that you've discussed, that, that, that sensitivity to the people that you work with comes across so much and um, a range of your work like I think that's a, the strength and the strand in your practice and um, perhaps you could say something about that particular work with uh, the name of which I could and got no fear and it was created with a group of um, young um, very young teenage well there were 11 to 14 year old boys and um, oh my god that project it was such an em and it is, emotional is it, was it can 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 the can, what's the name of the island of Kent? um it's uh, grain the isle of grain oh, isle of grain the isle of so. grain which is not actually an island but it's it's wetland a lot of it and it used well it still has um uh, a lot of industry um, so for that I worked for a year and I was visiting I was visiting weekly um, the, uh, the, the the Isle of you know village the village grain village grain village um, for various reasons uh, but primarily because I had heard that young people very young people organize raves and they are demonized by the police and by local residents and I wanted to know a bit more about it so I visited and uh, I, w I was looking for the rave site obviously I got lost that's the whole point of a rave, a rave site you can't you, you cannot be found <laughs> but then anyway so <clears throat> as I was navigating kind of walking uh, I got lost but then it was a chance encounter. I met uh, three young guys, uh, young men, um, and I told them what I was doing there, that I was interested in the rave, and I said, oh, we organize it, we can show you around. And um, and then I was under, I was trying to, I, I didn't try, I mean, they told me the reasons why they were organizing raves, and this is what I was saying earlier, that culture has this incredible ability to to give us hope and, and bring us to a place, a different place. So that place is completely, Grain Village and that part of North East Kent is so neglected. Uh, there's one road <laughs> going in and out of the village. Um, the, you know, recently, well at that time, 2016, the um, uh, BP uh, uh, refinery plant had was closing do down and um, the village be, having been built by BP, so it was a workers' village, um, was experiencing a lot of unemployment. There was no youth club, no um, high school, um, there was no bank, there was one bus, the last bus of the, in the evening was at six, six o'clock. So for young people, it's like they need to have a they need to make, they need to invent a way or to come together. And music and dancing together was that solution. It was a solution to that problem they were experiencing of being infrastructurally and, and socially and politically kind of neglected. And I feel like you 
really shone a light on that community and and many kind of issue, issues in in Britain actually where whole communities are cut off. Oh yeah, because I've also worked with coal miners who had yeah. lost their jobs. But in that film, just to give you, it's it's a long, slightly longer film. But basically, what we made is a music video in which the boys uh, rap about their lives. So they wrote a song uh, which is called "Ain't Got No Fear," and each verse of the song is about a different stage of their lives. Um, so again, utilizing art as a way to think, to reflect on the past, um, think about the present and also imagine the future. So they talk about being seven years old and then they go all the way to being 60 years old and what they imagine doing. And each section of the song they rap is performed in a part, in a part of that landscape, including the village and the, the um, the sea and uh, the industrial sites and some underground um, hideaways they have. So we get to discover through their performance and their eyes and their perspectives, we get to discover also their grain, their, their uh, grain, uh, vill oh my God, Isle of Grain, Grain Village, yes. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, I think it's just quite interesting to have um, a bit more of a context um, around Mikhail's um, practice, which has been going Thank on you. for a considerable time. Um, but uh, there must be some more qu questions, I think. I actually yes. wanted to um, thank you very much, of course, um, remark on or ask you about the difference between, for example, working with the Women Pearl Divers, which is a film that I must have watched about four times, and it's kind of next with, and working with much younger people, because it's very different, isn't it, working with an existing community uh, from which you're so far apart. You are... Uh, right. Um, in fact, a lot of that work, when I, that was in South Korea. So the project we're talking about was created with a group of octogenarians, uh, octogenarian uh, female pearl divers. Um, and in South Korea, where I don't speak the language, and well, on an island in South Korea, even like quite a remote place, uh, remote from my perspective, not from their perspective. Uh, so um, at the beginning, I was just um, observing, to be honest. And the way I approached them was um, rather than doing it directly, I, d uh, I approached them through a, a feminist group at the university of that island, um, the Jeju Island, um, where younger women um, who were uh, into feminist filmmaking and theory, that had grandmothers who were pearl, you know, some of those pearl divers. Mm -hmm. So they made that connection. They brought me to the to the spaces that they inhabit, where they work, where they eat and they cook, and um, they prepare their equipment before they go into the sea. And um, in that particular case, I didn't, I don't feel I added anything. I didn't initiate anything. I think I was observing and I was documenting. And that came after, actually not the very beginning, um, after they invited me to go diving with them. And there was an incident that was very funny. And it always, in my work, is always, a moment when there is something very coincidental and funny and quirky that happens that kind of breaks the ice and it changes the project. So in this particular case, at the beginning, you know, they were there, I was here, and then they invited me to do the, uh, to go diving with them. And obviously, I mean, they are, not only are they Asian and, you know, they're also um, women and uh, they are in the 80s, meaning they're, you're much smaller than me, 
you know, much shorter and, you know, much smaller. So I, they gave me one of the wetsuits and because I was so much taller, the, the top just popped off. <laughs> and they found it so funny that I, I stretched the, the wetsuit to the point that the top just popped off. So then you could see my bald head at the top and they found it very funny. They were talking about it for a long time. And then they came on the following day after that, they came with cameras to take photographs of me with them. That gave me a kind of passport to then bring my camera and just be around them without them really paying attention to me. They were very caring. When I went to the boat to film them, they told me, you're going to be very sick. Don't do it. But obviously I was very driven and I wanted to film them. And I was sick for two days because, you know, your eyes that connect with your inner ear, they try to find a horizon that is stable, but your body is constantly moving. So I was, I thought I was going to die. That was um, a, a great question. Thank you so much to Lara. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And please do leave your comments um, in the uh, Universal Solutions. But um, you're, are you happy to answer some more questions, Michael? Of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so does anyone have a, a question they'd like to ask? <laughs> What's, um, I don't know if you know the difference between like streaming or uploading 4K and 1080p. How much difference would that make if everyone just accepted 1080p rather than 4K? It makes a huge difference. You know, when you um, upload information, you know, data that is so much smaller, of course it makes a huge difference. Mm. So it's going to be worse at 8K. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things we've actually done in um, Exmouth is we, in our swimming pool, we is the water is partially heated by a server unit um, that mm. takes the excess heat and um, drops it into our pool in, in Exmouth, and it was quite a revolutionary project, wasn't it, uh, Councillor Hookway? So um, yeah, and uh, apparently it's the size of a fridge, and it use, we use it to preheat some of the water in our pool. But you know, that's a that's a good thing. <laughs> That's part of the universe of solutions, yes. right? It's amazing. Yes. It's that thinking outside the box. And I think that's what's so wonderful with art, isn't it? Is you get to have those conversations and explore hard and difficult topics in a way that is safe and um, allows you to use your imagination. You know, like, like you said, we all need to start thinking about things differently. And art allows you to do that in a, in a way that... Um, is difficult to get these complex images across, is it? These complex ideas and um, um, concepts, isn't it? So, which is why work like yours is so very important. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm conscious there's a question there, um, but in response to this, I'm thinking that I, I very often think about who is ruling countries and the fact that politicians, um, um, they are, they come from different disciplines, but not usually from the cult from culture, mm. from the arts. And um, I'm thinking if you know, science, science it has the ability to come up with you know practical you know solutions to something. But then, in order for a political class to be able to imagine solutions and propose solutions and then test them with you know go through the scientists and say, okay, so how about this? Is that possible? Um, in order for that to happen, I think there has to be a much closer connection between you know, politics and, and this kind of humanities in general. I mean, it could be philosophy. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be art, but the kind of creative industries and humanities, because that's the, that's, these are the ones. I mean, people go to university to study design or art or whatever, and it's, they are cultivating, they're nourishing their imagination. They're cultivating the way of imagining something and then making it real. Um, and I think these people, are very, will be very important, they are very important, but they will be very important in, in conjuring up hopeful and different images of what our future, yeah. you know, how we can have a kind of better future. Yeah. And we, we need system change, not climate change. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just intrigued, really. I'm, I'm brand new to learning about your practice through mm. learning about this exhibition. Um, and it sounds like you, you're working in loads of different contexts. 
obviously there's a thread of climate and the thread of, of working directly with people. But I was, I'm just intrigued, like, what's your ideas process? And you, is it, at this point in your career, very cumulative and you're building on things as they come? Or are you mostly working to commission, so you're working within a brief? Like, how are you pulling in these ideas from de very disparate parts of the world? And hmm. um, well, all my work has been about the. I mean, if I think back to like two thousand and eight, when I created the my first work that was connected with the community. Before I was working more with like uh, fellow artists, performers, and and that. But then I made this decision. I made a conscious decision not to work with people that are that in a way come from similar backgrounds, educational backgrounds to me. Um, and work with people that whose whose professions at that point connects to to the environment in in a kind of direct way. So, hence we have the project uh, Sounds from Beneath, uh, for which I work with coal miners. Um, then the pearl divers. Um, so again, these are very different, but one is about extractivist form of an extractivist kind of relationship to the planet. The other one with the pearl divers actually is very interesting because their model of working is proto-eco-feminist, I would say. The way they work um, and the way they respect the cycles of, of reproduction of, of sea life and how they have very, <coughs> everything is hand-picked and the, it's a very sustainable way of working, um, which then inspired me to look at sustainable energy production in the present and go to Italy where the very first geothermal power plant in the world was built, which is, it led to the project Children of Unquiet, which had a lot of different output, out, outputs, but the, you know, Children of Unquiet is also a film that is like a central part of the project. Um, and, and for that I've worked with children and we're looking at ideas of protest and energy. Um, and then, you know, my ideas evolved closer to, you know, childhood and eco-activism with other, with other projects. So to me, it seems that I'm doing the same thing. Um, it's just, I'm looking at it through the perspective of different people in different locations. But the theme is always the same, which is about our relationship to the planet. Um, now, maybe my theme, because I'm working on def several projects, but my theme is very specific to you know, climate change and, and um, flood, flooding and how um, the future, our future will be transformed because because of flooding, so it's more specific for the next for the next year and a half. So when I start working with, and the moment there are communities in different part in different countries, but I we have, we have several conversations about where they're at in terms of their thinking, especially with young people. Um, but I always introduce the climate modeling data the websites I look at. Um, so I'm also, what's the word? It's not just what I'm, how can I say, what what I find is also what I, you know, what I... Intuitively feel. As well, yes. <laughs> that's really interesting, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably a good place to, to stop. You yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I'm happy to continue also informally. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the photographers.